So this is our final session. We're looking at church planting, honoring the title of our, uh, our network, uh, Church Life, Leadership and Planting. We could do a whole network on planting, obviously. We're going to look at some principles about planting, uh, particularly unpacking Paul's letter to Titus. Um, people who, who have worked with me over the years will know that this has been a bit of a mainstay of our philosophy of pioneering. It's also one of the shortest letters in the Bible, which makes it very appealing for me. So if you want to turn to uh, uh, Titus, hold it open. Uh, we won't have the opportunity to read the whole thing, but we're going to be referring extensively to that letter. So it's describing uh, the aftermath, if you like, of Paul's missionary visit to Crete. He's writing to Titus, one of his sons, about his work among these churches. He visits Crete with Titus. This is post Acts 28. So we don't have the narrative of that visit, but we have the, obviously the record of that here. They'd seen converts in several communities across uh, the island. He left Titus behind to get the emerging church organized and to straighten out what was left unfinished. It tells us in verse 5, and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So here we have this church planting movement across the island of Crete, straightening out what was unfinished and appointing elders in, in every town as I directed you. I, I, I'm a great fan of, um, of Titus. I get the impression he was a no-nonsense guy. Timothy, he needed a little bit more attention you know, oh, Timothy, take a bit of wine for your tummy. And, uh, you know, he tells people in the churches, don't say anything that's going to frighten Timothy. Okay? <laughs> Whereas uh, Titus, you get the impression he was a bit more of a bruiser. You know, go, go on, get in there, Titus. Straighten it out. Sort this out. You know, no nonsense. And uh, the, well, the question I just want to raise straight off the bat, really, I want an opportunity for you to discuss this in a moment. What was, uh, what would that look like for us? And what might, what situation might you come across in your own mission endeavors that is the situation where you need to say to someone, can you go in and straighten that out? You know, something's happening. God's on the move. People are getting saved. Now we need to straighten that out and we need to raise up local biblical officers to take responsibility for that. What might that look like for yourself? What opportunities are there for us? What opportunities are already in front of you to straighten something out? And now here are some of the ways in which we've initiated church plants in our own sort of family of churches. This is some of the ways that this has come about, that we then need to straighten out something. So it could be believers traveling from another town or district to visit our church and say, hey, we'd love to see something happening in our own town. Well, that could be a situation that needs straightening out and starting to bring some definition to that. It could be that we've been on an evangelistic mission or outreach that has borne fruit in another town or another district. And that could be something that needs to be straightened out and shaped. It could be an invitation from a household of peace in another town. They say that, hey, you know, opening a doorway for us into a community where we can go and begin to minister. It could be a number of households or individuals who have faith for God's mission in another town and have relocated there for that purpose. So we've just sent a team to Nijmegen in the Netherlands. There's uh, four households from four different churches in three different nations, all feeling a heart for what God is doing in Nijmegen. So they're they landed there last summer, started to outwork, build a prototype community um, and started to outwork something there. I dare say sooner or later, I will need to go and straighten something out over there. It could be a missionary couple who has the faith to move to another town or district and outlive a gospel life, start to gather believers and unbelievers in their home. What's, how's, how's that going to be? How do we start to see that shape and grow and straighten out? It could be entrepreneurial mission, you know, pursuing creative ideas to present the gospel in a town. Uh, we, we, we had someone who had faith to open a bookshop in a town. 
And um, he was like the worst businessman ever. But I gave him faith for this. And he opened up an opportunity for her. And uh, out of that, a church began to grow. And it's the church that John leads even to this day. Began with someone who just said, I've got faith for that town and I'm going to do something. And then we had to go and <laughs> straighten it out. So sometimes we're sort of anxious about creating an opportunity. How do we create an opportunity? It could be that there are opportunities already, already in front of us uh, to, to see an emerging gospel community that may grow to become an established church and, and a, a church has been planted in that context. Whatever shape or size or model that is, you know, the, 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 the style is not the significant thing. The DNA is a significant thing. Um, but, you know, so whether it's a house church, whether it's a mega church, in some senses, I don't mind. What, what is the DNA, you know, and how is that DNA being worked out? So sometimes we, we can be thinking, how are we going to do this? And actually God is already presenting you with opportunities. There's, there's opportunities already in front of us. So we're going to ask ourselves that question in just a moment, just for a few minutes, you know, just a bit of a, an audit of your own circumstances. What opportunities has God already put in front of us that maybe we just haven't recognized as opportunities? I've given you some examples there. And just to maybe that God will sow something of faith in your heart about that situation. Just one reflection on that. Um, one lesson that we have learned over the years in our pioneering efforts is that the bigger the team you can start with, the more rapidly the mission and subsequent church plant development will happen. Now, we've said individuals, we've said couples, but it can take a long time for them to recruit other believers to their mission. Uh, and when people are saved, they, uh, it absorbs all their energy trying to disciple and care for those who are being saved with them. And so we encourage our pioneers to recruit, if at all possible, to recruit others who will share the work with them, who understand the DNA of what they're trying to build, who can say, we're going to be co-laborers, running mates with you, raising and recruiting an army for the battle. And, um, you know, if, if, if you're hoping to gather a church, it's great if you can first gather a team, uh, a prototype community that you can then, those who are being saved can be added into a community that you've already established the culture of that community. So that, that's not a sort of a blueprint or a rule, just saying that's our experience, that we've sent uh, individuals and, and couples on their own. It's a very, very long journey. If they are able to recruit others to come with them and share the journey with them, the process is accelerated. I just wanted to obviously just stir us to think about what opportunities might be in front of us. I mean, Crete is a fascinating situation. It was not particularly strategic or significant in some senses. Paul actually had no plans to be there. He arrived there blown by a storm. Um, Cretans didn't have a particularly good reputation. You read that in verses, tw I don't know how he gets away with saying this. I can't imagine I could ever get away with saying this. In verse 12 of chapter 1, he says, you know, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons, and this testimony is true. It's not always the best way to lead in terms of trying to break into a community that you're hoping to reach for the gospel, but somehow Paul got away with that. But... Um, you know, even though, you know, he didn't plan to be in Crete, he, uh, the, he arrived there, that he had this particular perspective on their culture, his attention to the churches and his expectations of them were no different to anywhere else. You know, it's important for us to understand that. You know, we might, you know, there, there, there is no difference in expectation for what he was hoping to see develop and grow here that it might have been in any other place that might have been seen. You know, so our pioneering journey started in some very unglamorous rural areas of England. And, uh, but you know, our expectations of the quality of church community that we build there will be no different to if we were in some strategic, glamorous city. No, you know, Paul has these expectations. He has such a high view of the church. I think if we're pioneering, 
obviously we, we, we must be broken for the lost, but also have such a high view of his church. And uh, it's such a beautiful thing just to remind ourselves of God's purpose and intention for the church. It's always been his intention to have for himself a family gathered from all people groups of the earth, one new man from every tongue, tribe, and nation. This is his delight. This is his joy. Is it any surprise that the enemy would seek at every turn to wreck that and separate us out? And, you know, because it's the one thing that God wants. He wants one new nation, one new man, to be in fellowship with man so that his glory might be revealed in all the earth. And the, I, the scriptures are there uh, on your outlines. So I'm just going to rattle through. The, this community is going to be the light of the world. This is God's view for his church. Uh, we read in Isaiah 60, it's the praise of the earth in Isaiah 62. It's the wisdom of God. We can read that in Ephesians 3. It's the dwelling place of God. What a view that God has for the church. How, how can we articulate mission without understanding what it means that people are saved and added to the household of God and to his church? I went to a Bible college once. I did some studies at a Bible college. I just arrived and they asked me to address all the students. There are about 200 students. And I said, well, I'm just the new, I'm the new guy. Why, why do you want me to speak to them? He said, because you have come from, we know that you've come from a situation where you still have a high value for the church. Whereas most of the people here have lost confidence in the church and see the church as the major obstacle for mission. That's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. You know? No, the church is the light of the world. It's the praise of the earth. It's the wisdom of God, the dwelling place, the bride of Christ. You know, Jesus could choose any bride in the universe. He chooses the church. It's the very body of Christ. He so loved the church that he gave himself up for her. I will build my church and a city on a hill which cannot be hid. This is God's heart for his household, for his church. It's a church built on the word of God, full of the presence and power of God by his spirit, enjoying the grace of God, understanding what it means to be the family of God, committed to the mission of God. We just catch something of heart and the heart that God has for his church. And so this is what Paul is wanting to see established here even in Crete, where he arrived in a shipwreck. What directions did Paul give to Titus? So he said, straighten things out. Well, what directions does he give? So it's helpful to note, as we go through this short letter, what Paul's focus is in terms of development issues for shaping an emerging church, and what his focus is not. Well, he doesn't mention, he doesn't mention what is your program of activity. He doesn't mention how many numbers are you gathering. That doesn't get a mention here. But he mentions some other things that I think, what, whatever your pioneering ambitions, these principles are helpful to carry with you in your thinking. So I'm just going to pick out uh, one, two, three, four things that uh, directions that Paul gave to Titus. First, uh, not necessarily in order of priority, but um, here we go. So he gives, he says to Titus to give attention to raising up quality leadership. I'll define what I mean by that in a moment. And so in verses six to nine of chapter one, you see these uh, characteristic attributes of those that are emerging as, uh, as leaders, elders among them there. You're familiar with this passage of scripture. The important thing to note is that you cannot appraise these things outside of relationship. How can you possibly know these things if you don't have a relationship with the person that you're appraising? And th that's my, my appeal not to uh, look for leaders in the back of a Christian magazine. <laughs> no, you know, how do we know that their reputation is good with outsiders, how their children are behaving? How do we know that? Well, we can know that because we... We're sharing our lives with them and we're close to them in that way. You know. So there's this loyalty, holding firm, you know, in, in verse 9, holding firm to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others. So loyal, uh, we're seeing these attributes, they're loyal to apostolic values and prophetic vision. And uh, this is how we evaluate these leaders uh, is Paul's appeal. 
our appeal would be develop oversized leadership team. Always have more, always have more leaders than you need. The reason for that being that, you know, you've got your current requirements, but also you've got your future requirements. They're going to be leaders that are going to retire uh, among you or, or, you know, feel that they, they've fulfilled their, their service. Um, there are going to be wider needs, you know, other churches that maybe are uh, needing strengthening and you say, hey, we've got some leaders we can give you. Or there's going to be multiplied needs if you want to plant, uh, you know, if you have a vision to plant 10 churches in your province, well, you're going to need 10 teams of leaders, you know. So where are those leaders going to come from? So, you know, always don't, don't consider, you know, we have enough leaders. Consider who, who is God raising up as leaders among us here? Because they may be for us, but they may be for others. Can we raise them up and send them and release them? So catch people up, catch their hearts up with the stories, the ups and the downs. You know, you hear Paul in, in uh, 2 Corinthians saying, you know, I'm so grateful that Titus, he's got the same heart for you as I have. He's caught this heart for you, you know. So it's not just a delegation of responsibility and duty, but it's raising up men and women who share, share your heart for what you're doing. They say, oh, we're, oh we, we see that as well. We're with you in that. We want to go with you on that. Introduce emerging leaders to each other. Build networks of friendships. I have had a secret plan this week. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> that, you know, I brought, a, I brought a large team with me. I brought, there's myself and there's 10 other people in the room here who come from among our, among our network. Most of them didn't realize we were going to get them working, you know, on the, the tables. But there's, a re there's another reason why I brought them. I wanted them to get to know each other. Some of them had never met each other before they came here in different churches and different contexts. And now, you know, the firm friendships have been built, respect and recognition. And, oh, you know, I've seen you across the room, never had a chance to meet you. And so even as we're seeking to do our best to serve you, I'm also serving my own purpose <laughs> in building strength for our own family of churches and uh, the connection and friendships that emerge among the team that we brought with us. And then obviously there's this sort of... Uh, if you like, when we read these attributes and characteristics of leadership, it's an irreducible minimum requirement for governmental eldership in the church. And I really want to appeal to us on this, whether, whether you're, you know, sort of a small house church, whether you're a church of a hundred in a market town, whether you're a church of a thousand in a city, whatever it might be, these attributes apply. You know, it's not like, there might be different skills. You may have different skills required according to the context of the mission, but the attributes of trust and trustable governmental officers in your church, it doesn't matter that this is the gate. This is what we're looking for. So you don't sort of lower the bar because you think, oh, well, it's, just, it's just a small thing happening over there. No, this was um, you know, a small island full of evil brutes and liars, <laughs> you know? according to Paul, and yet he's saying, this is what I expect. This is what I expect of uh, the character of leaders that we're going to raise up among ourselves. So that's one of the things, that's one of the directions that Paul gave to Titus. The second direction he gave was to raise quality disciples. And he takes that through, you can read that through from verse 10 in chapter 1 through to verse 10 of chapter 2. He's addressing uh, what it means for people to be uh, loyal, devoted members of this community of God among us. What we're looking for, you know, what we're looking for in how we prepare older men, younger men, older women, younger women. How do we, how do we create that expectation of what it means to be a disciple? We're looking for create. We're not looking for attendance. We're, we're looking for quality of fellowship following Jesus, wanting to be, having an appetite for Jesus, being appetized for the things of the Spirit, not the things of this world. That's the evidence of grace, you know. Our appetites change. You know, we're not trying to fight with people for, uh, to sort of tear them away from the world. But if, if the grace of God is in their hearts, the gospel of Jesus is doing its work, the Spirit of God is operative upon them, their appetites will be changing. And we nurture and nourish them in their fresh appetites making quality disciples. This is our most significant legacy 
Nowhere in the world are you going to find any church that Paul planted. But what you will find is that his DNA has been handed down from generation to generation. As uh, he said to Timothy, you know, that which you receive from me and trust to trustworthy people. And that is really that. I've, I've come to understand through all the years that I've been involved in Christian ministry, I've come to understand that at the end of the day, my job is to take a precious deposit and carry it and hand it to the next generation. Uh, this precious deposit, the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the gospel of grace, the full apostolic revelation, those things that were revealed to God's holy apostles and prophets in the New Testament that were not known by generations before, hadn't been revealed before. Now it's been revealed that the, the, the ever reigning Christ, that we are the temple, that, that, that we are, we're ushering in the, the kingdom of God, all of these things that come through the revelation of the apostles and prophets in the New Testament. And that's a deposit that we've been entrusted with, a DNA. And I now have to carry that and hand it on to those who come after me. And so my legacy is not going to be measured on big buildings or networks or churches that I have built. That's not my legacy. You know, I've seen all that. It's not my legacy. My legacy is in sons and daughters who have been raised up in the most holy faith, who have embraced these godly values and are able to run and articulate that and, 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 uh, and outwork that in their generation, in their context, in a faithful way that is faithful to the word as has been given to us. Discipleship is the core of what we have been given to do. Go make disciples. Jesus will build the church. If you make, you've heard it said before by wiser men than me, you know, if, if you uh, build the church, but don't make, you know, you, you won't necessarily get disciples, but if you make disciples, you will get a church. So that's what we give our attention to, quality membership. People that hold fast to the trustworthy message. We read about this in, in verse 9 of chapter 1, holding firmly to the trustworthy message, holding firmly to the vision, holding firmly not in, with appropriate loyalty, holding firmly to their leaders. This is what we're looking for in terms of quality membership. It's nothing to do with class, background, wealth, ability, intellect, secular success it doesn't matter how impressive they are are they holding firm to the the, the values are they rejoicing in, and giving their their time and their treasure and their talents to the vision and are they faithful and loyal to their leaders in an appropriate way that's what we're looking for in terms of quality discipleship and then we look for um the third thing that paul is attentive to he um he says yeah, in terms of raising up and shaping growing communities of believers, then be attentive to the leadership, be attentive to the membership with the disciples. Lay foundations of sound doctrine. And this is beautiful. And I love this letter for this. It's absolutely beautiful. We know that Titus is very familiar, bless you. We know that Titus was very familiar with Paul's doctrine because he accompanied Paul to Jerusalem when he went to have his doctrine checked out by the others purported to be apostles as he described them he uh the titus was with him so he was very familiar with paul's emphasis and paul's emphasis that unfolds in titus 2 and elsewhere but but sort of cap captured very succinctly in this uh particular um letter is that godly behavior inevitably arises from a correct grasp of godly truth so, and you, you know this, all through Paul's letters you read this, you know, you can impose rules and expectation and external demand on someone to bring about their behavior, but if their heart isn't transformed, as soon as you remove that demand, their behavior will slip back to how it was. The only way their behavior is going to change is if their heart is changed. Ultimately, that's the only way people's behavior will change. You can tell them what to wear, what to drink, what to eat, how to behave. But if, in that, if their heart isn't transformed, it's worthless. Well, Paul says, you know, it has some value in, you know, restraining sensual indulgence. He said, but that's not how people are going to change. They're going to be changed in the heart. And they're changed in the heart because they're, they've got a correct grasp of the truth. A correct grasp of the grace of God motivates men and women to holy living. The grace of God does his work for you. 
The grace of God teaches us to say no, the Bible says, to ungodly passions and behavior. So here we see this, right? Where do we see this then? In chapter 1 and verse 1, straight from the beginning, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Boom. Okay? It's there. We see it again in uh, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men it teach the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Fantastic. Yeah. It's not rules and regulations. It's the, the operate the operative power of the gospel of grace in the heart of the believer leads them to have an appetite to live a godly life and empowers them to say no. Man, I think Europe needs this message so much. It needs this message so much. goes on in uh, chapter 3 and verse 8. This is a trustworthy saying. I want you to stress these things. Are you feeling my stressing of these things at the moment, dear? I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Why does he say that? Well, back in 7, it says, we've been justified by his grace, so we might become heirs having this hope of eternal life. And this then uh, brings, bears about fruit of godly living and doing good things. He then applies that in these verses to older men. He applies it to older women. He applies it to younger women. He applies it to younger men. He applies it to slaves. He's saying this is the expectation. If you are rejoicing in the grace of God, this is going to condition you to live in a way that pleases God. And if, we, if the only way we can compel people to live apparently godly lives is by imposing external demands on them, they have not grasped the gospel. That's the reality. That's what Paul is saying here. So I let's thoroughly baptize everybody in the grace of God. I've got uh, four children, two of my sons. I've got a, a, a book reading club with them. We're reading a book on, on God's lavish grace. I just thought if I can, if, if, I, if people understand the grace of God, everything else, everything else follows, everything else outworks from that. So... And then finally, uh, the fourth thing that Paul says is, uh, is being ruthless with opposing error. So in chapter 1 and verses 10 to 14 here, there are many rebellious people, talkers and deceivers, especially in those of the circumcision group. I pray you don't have one of those in your church. They must be silenced because they're ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and this for the sake of dishonest gain. You know, he's, he said, no, you know, the finished work of Jesus Christ is sufficient. If anybody has tried to add anything to this gospel, then we've got to be ruthless with opposing error and bring people back to this apostolic plumb line. That it's the grace of God. Paul, Paul's apostolic perspective is clear. Develop your leaders well. Make excellent disciples. Make sure the correct truth is being taught. The church will then enjoy health and growth. So if you want to reach the world, get the church right. Godly truth leads us to godly action which fulfills godly purpose. So these are the things that Paul, the instructions that Paul gives to Titus about what it means to straighten out things. And finally, briefly, what Paul does, what directions did Paul give to the churches that were growing and emerging? This is fascinating. I love this. This is, is extraordinary, in fact. So chapter 3 and verse 14, he says this, our, our people, this is his sort of instruction to the church, must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. The, the, doing what is good is a common theme in this letter for Paul about what is maturity in the church. You know, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. What is the ultimate measurement of a mature church? It's a heart to serve. And Paul, is, he, he says this right the way through this letter, that we must be, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. It's, 
It's a leadership example. You see that in chapter 2 and verse 7. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. So doing what is good is an example of leadership. It's the consequence and evidence of grace. In verse 14, it says, you know, we, uh, um, we, well, in verse 13, we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of Jesus who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. It's the consequence of the evidence of grace is that we're eager to do what is good. It's an appropriate attitude to authority. In chapter 3, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be, to be ready to do whatever is good. Verse 8 is an excellent response to the gospel. Chapter 3, verse 8. This is trustworthy saying. We've just had this verse earlier. Those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. And the lack of doing good is evidence of a bad gospel. In chapter 1 and verse 16, it says, you know, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. So our work is a missional demonstration. Our work, all of us here, wherever God has placed you, we are, we're a missional demonstration of the kindness and goodness of God not just to those who are being redeemed, but to the whole community, uh, but particularly to those among us who are the least. So there we go.